I am unashamed. What about you? So we're excited today. We're welcome back an old friend. I, I looked in the notes, Kyle. So it was almost exactly to the to the week. Yeah, about a year ago, uh, we had you on the podcast. This uh, Kyle, but I wasn't here. You, you weren't were here. My replacement. Mm-hmm. So right. I, I Ky- sat in your chair. It was really. It was still warm. Which oh, was weird, so really? I don't know about that. <laughs> Did you talk more than normal when you sat here? No, I just interrupted more than normal. Oh, so well, that's, that's like, it. Yeah, so <laughs> that's what I did. So I was like, I have to fulfill <laughs> the interruption Larry Bowles says it's the chair, too. I don't it's know what chair. it is. <laughs> it's the chair. It's the chair. Right, we've discovered <laughs> it's the chair. So, uh, Unashamed uh, Wizard, don't get mad at Jay. Just get mad at the chair. Uh, Kyle Thompson, uh, who has a podcast called uh, the The Undaunted Life, is that correct? Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Yeah, there you go. And uh, it's uh, a lot of a lot of you guys have have seen it when Kyle was on before and crossed over, because our audience is is more male than female, and yours is almost all male. You said ninety percent, maybe. Yeah, that even. Is representing. Look he's, at that. Yeah. No, he's got a symbol there. What are you going to yeah, do? Yeah, tell us that? about the symbol. Yeah, so uh, the long story short is, is whenever I was learning how to become a man, I was also learning how to become a Christian, right? So around the age of 13 or whatever. And so I felt like all the manly men were outside the church doing man stuff and yeah. all the godly men were inside the church with their, you know, pleated pants and their I'll pray for your brothers and <laughs> which is which is fine like I'm not I'm not getting getting after anybody I guess well, you're going to fit in nicely here well, well but the thing, culture but the thing about it is is um I felt like there was this overemphasis on the lamb of god to the detriment and complete ignoring of the lion of judah and I didn't have the words for it at the time but it's like okay you're not going to understand the totality of Christ if you understand him as only grace our yeah. only lamb. You have to understand him as truth and you have to understand him as lion. And so part of the thing with the logo is I just, I, I think it's awesome. Shout out to my boy, Joel, Joel Uber, who, who put that together for us. But it's, uh, I sign off every episode with and keep seeking the lion of Judah. Yeah. And that's just because it's like the pendulum has swung so far to the lamb side that there are guys, especially guys mm. that, you know, maybe the grace stuff doesn't really make sense. Like the emotive music doesn't really make sense to them. It's, it's the war, the war God. And it's, you know, the, the judgment of God and the fear of God, like that's the stuff that kind of jives with them more. So that's the reason for the logo. And yeah. I mean, we got people, I got another picture over the weekend guy got a tattooed on him. And so like the people, people enjoy the logo, but it's really like, guys, it's like, don't just focus on the lion either. Like, yeah, but again, you have right. to focus on both. And we talked about that even yeah. in our Hebrew study, the way we framed it. I, I like that. I like mm-hmm. the lamb and the lion because we framed it as the king and the priest. Right. Same concept. You got the tribe of Levi, which was the priesthood. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, the lamb of God. But he's also the king. Right. He's the lion. He's the ruler. And when he came to earth, you and I were talking about this last night. We, he, he showed a lot of himself in this role, even while he was here. And you talked about two or three examples. One was the cleansing of the temple. I mean, that wasn't a passive, a docile, lamb-like event. It's it's a balance. I mean, you you don't, I mean, to me, look at the extreme. You don't want to have a sign on a road saying the end is near, you know, turn or burn. Yeah. And you don't want to be out in front of You think it's hot. Here, well, right, yeah, I'm sure I've gotten some emails about that, but and you don't want to be like outside of church building and say it's okay, buddy, it's okay, everything's right. fine, everything's great. So, I mean, I think that's the two extremes. And so, point. so, so last night, uh, so Kyle got in yesterday, so he he mentioned something about a steak. I said, I'll take you out to eat my favorite steak place. So, we went to Doe's Eat Place, which is one of my favorites here in town. And uh, so I kind of, you know, he was like, he was waiting for us to order to see how big to go. But I knew, you know, I was like, I bet this guy can eat, you know, and he's, he's not a huge guy, but he's muscle, you know, I thought this guy could. So I started goading and they have a steak there. That's a steak for two. So 32 yeah. ounce bone. Oh, I've rhythm. had it. Oh, I've had it. Yeah. It's, and, and it's, you get four sides and two salads cause it's meant for two people. But I was like, yeah, I got a box yeah. after it was over. Hey, no box. <laughs> See, the box would have only had like cauliflower and carrots in it. And so it's like all the stuff that needed to be eaten right then and there was was destroyed. It was so, impressive. It reminded me of Trent Langhofer. We've had Trent yeah. before. I mean, I all guess guys muscle, that work yeah. out a lot can eat a lot. That's, That's just the bottom line. Did you not eat the sides? Did you eat the sides it, as well? Or did you leave those the out? high now, carb sides. <laughs> yeah. So I, I ate the mac and cheese and the uh, baked potato. Um, but I, you know, I didn't find any room for the green beans. And that's the thing is like, I will, I will just eat a bowl of green beans 
things by by themselves. So it's like I'm not anti vegetable, but it's like there is an order of operations here. It's like I need to focus on this bicycle seat of meat first and make sure that that yeah. gets down. But I'll tell you, like I, I told everybody, like if they wanted if they wanted dessert. I was ready. Like I have a separate stomach for pudding and cake and, you know, cobbler and all that stuff. So, you know, I'm, I was good to go, I guess. I was impressed. It was like, okay, this is going to be fun. And so then, so we get down here, dad. So we, I, I mentioned on the Helix ad yesterday that your Helix mattress has arrived. So it's been sitting in front of my house. Jay was supposed to bring it down here. So they, they ship it in a box. You know, and you think, well, that, that can't be a mattress. Cause yeah, I was trying to figure out how you get a mattress that would fit on a bed for your woman and yourself in a pickup truck in the back of the truck. W without looking like a big mattress, right? Going down the road with you a know, strap over the The top. bed of a pickup truck is not big enough to hold the mattress. So, so how it was that in work? a box. So I picked that. So I, I, I backed my truck up to it, and I was like, I moved. I was like, whoa. So I, I just put it against the truck, and I had enough to lift it up and get it in the truck. When I, I was coming out here, and I thought, I, you know, I, I got elbow problems. This, this is, I can't be the other half of this two-man job. So I thought about Kyle being here today. I said, they put Kyle, me to work immediately. I said, Kyle, I got a job for you. He said, well, you, got, you fed me a steak last night. So I put him and Dan on. So do I remove the existing? Tell him, tell him the, yeah, so, he knew the science of it. Yeah, so basically, I mean, this this box looks like, you know, it has a small Christmas tree in it, not a, not a king-size mattress. But I guess it's like NASA technology, but how they store it. And like, they, they basically shrink wrap it. And the moment it starts to hit air, it'll start to inflate. And so there's like two or three, you know, uh, so wrappings of plastic. So get through the door before this, this yeah, process. Yeah, so, so we went over to the house. And so you got a new nap uh, spot whenever you get back to the house. But we took the old mattress, put it in a different room. But literally right on top of the box spring, we start taking the plastic off. And you can literally hear it go pssst, after the oh, first layer of plastic. Nice. And it's then the like second the, layer. It's like the movie when the uh, Chevy Chase cut down the Christmas tree and they had it tied up and they had it on top of it. That's roof. right. And then when he got it in there, you could hear the ropes, the tension. Yeah. And when he cut it, it busted out all the windows. <laughs> well, sap went everywhere. Well, so the guy that was yeah. hoping, he, he, he goes, hey, did, so we just cut into this? Is this going to kind of, I was like, look, there would be way too many lawsuits if this thing just like exploded <laughs> into the room or whatever. And so, no, it's like, it's a slow, it's kind of like slowly, slowly, slowly. And then kind of all okay. at once, three or four seconds later, you got Boom. a king size mattress. Boom. Yeah. Right there. Huh. Which is pretty amazing. Modern technology, Phil. Uh, you right. were here to see it. Yeah. I'm slow to learn on high tech equipment. Yeah. So. Yeah. Miss K was a little too comfortable in her seat. She didn't want to come see the, the science experiment <laughs> we were doing in the bedroom. But, you know, she was like, no, nah, I trust I trust you. It's fine. I was like, you got it, Miss no, K. She's swatting bumblebees <laughs> oh, and tendons are tearing loose from her fingers. I, I, I'm like, she, she has an injury. <laughs> Well, we ate steaks last night. I should have just came down. Well, really? we, we were having a meeting over our metal detectors. You know, oh. we're doing doing that event this week, but which I guess we would have already done it by the time this runs. Yeah. But uh, so I walk into Jep's house, and I could only see probably three to five feet in front of me. It was like a fog advisory oh, in his house. So he had these steaks that were huge. Some of them were huge. And he had the fire wide open on the stove. Oh, he was a, it, doing a doing a like a sear. It was a sear. Yeah. But I was like, well, there's no way these things are going to be done. What I, I found out later, of course, about every couple minutes, the fire alarm, would go, <laughs> smoke alarm, would go off, and it was so loud. Kids started crying, dogs barking, the cats going. Rah! <laughs> And so there's nothing that sets the tone for a meeting better, a dinner meeting, than everybody screaming and hollering. Just, the babies were crying. I mean, I just thought, this reminds me of my childhood, you know? And Missy's like, this this can't be good. I'm, and Jeff's like, this will be the best steak you ever ate. But so Jeff had done something that I thought was weird, because I was feeling not good about this. He uh he took the steaks and had them like in a bag and he boiled them in yeah. some kind of yeah. water. Yeah. Sous vide. Yeah. Sous -vide. You've seen that? Yeah. yeah. Right. It's a it's a thing. Well, he's telling me. And I was like, I don't know. That just didn't seem like a good thing. But so then he takes them out. Then he gets the fire as hot as it can go yeah. and ruin two black cast iron skillets. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen smoke come out of a skillet like that. You can see people are coughing. They opened all the doors, all the windows. 
But was the steak good? Was I, it good? I was get. I will admit when when I took that, uh, my, you know, I was crying. <laughs> but when I, I was literally crying. Yeah. When I put it in my mouth, I thought it's worth it. It's it, worth it. It, it was a moment because everybody was crying because it was so good. But and the smoke was, you know, in, in our lungs. <laughs> so the eye. steaks we had last night were prepared the same way because that's the way they do it now. So you get it up to the oh, they did the same. thing. They all do it. They all, they get it up to temp, and all you're doing is putting a sear on the outside with that last step. And so yeah, that's they, why they, they put them in the bowl and water. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, you yeah. either do that or like whenever I'm doing a, a thick steak, I'll put in a. I'll put it in my oven on convection, which the heat is all around as opposed to just from the bottom. And so I'll bring it up slowly to like 100 degrees or something like that. But then I'll put it on a cast iron skillet as high as it can be. And there will be butter and garlic and thyme and all that in there. And so 30, 45 seconds on one side, 30, 45 seconds on the other. Take it off. Well, he probably left it a couple minutes. I mean, but there's more than one way to get it to temp. But that's one way now that they do. And it just gets it where it needs to be. But yeah, that's because you think about it. How else would you prepare steaks for a bunch of people at one time? Unless you had them ready to roll, right? I mean, it was so funny because Missy, because then I was like, "How'd you do?" Well, then all of a sudden, that's I got the information later, you know, the exact information. Because, but Missy was like, "What's wrong with y'all?" Because I mean, she's looking around, like, "Why would you go through all that?" I was like, "Cause it was so good." She's <laughs> like, "Yeah, I know, but it's not worth it." I Super can't worth it. see. <laughs> the kids are all just well, once crying. You, once it hit your lips, it didn't matter. All that to went me, away, it was all worth. That yeah. just made. I mean, I'm like, and I tried to segue into, babe. That's this is Hebrews. This is we're in the wilderness. <laughs> we're complaining. We're in misery, and then you're like, oh wait, manna from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and quail. That's right. <laughs> and fresh quail. But that didn't work. She was already bitter because I, about two nights before, she, because you know how I love her beans and rice and Mexican cornbread. Right. And uh, so I didn't eat all day because I knew she was cooking that. And I mean, it's not, when you think beans and rice, you're like, oh, I mean, what's the big deal? But you've had it. I mean, it, 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 there's something. She's, she's got it down here. There's 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 a lot of little subtle. That's the beans I grew up. Amenities sure. and yeah, I mean, you got ham and hot jalapeno sausage. You know, as in with the beans and rice, and then this cornbread just takes on. It's it's got bacon on one side and cheese on the other. Cornbread in the middle. Oh, it's something oh, yeah, it's with something. a few jalapenos. And that's available for after this, or <laughs> yeah, or not. So, <laughs> so I go in there and eat way too much because I hadn't eaten anything all day. Right. Which so it calls me just to immediately go lay down and sleep for two hours on the couch. <laughs> So I wake up now. I'm just kind of rum dumb. Jace but, is now portraying the good life. Yeah, but but look, but I I wanted something. Life is good. I wanted something sweet, but we don't eat sweets, and I usually don't eat sweet. But you know, when you sleep so hard, you wake up and you're actually hungrier then. Yeah. And so I go in there. Well, I look, and my wife has bought a bag of white powdered donut. I mean, we hadn't. She hadn't done that. In, she just went to the grocery store. I mean, I remember our childhood. You love you oh, I love those donut. powder white donut, but I Jason told her. We all had to fight over them, you know, because you only got one bag, and they had to divvy yeah. them up. So I told her a couple years ago, quit buying those, because I can't. I mean, I just, you know, you reach an age where. You can't control it. there they were. <laughs> <laughs> so I, hey, oh. Hang on. Let's take a break. One of the things that uh, none of us want to do is uh, lose our hair. Uh, it's just kind of a, you know, men like to hang on to it as long as they can. Is that safe to say, Jeff? I mean, it's optional. I, mean, I don't want somebody to pull it out by the roots. <laughs> Remember when mom used to pull our hair? Yeah. Made me it was, mad. It was an effective tool. It was. And I, I can't blame her. We were all big and strong, and she's tiny. We needed to have our hair pulled. Well, if so a lot of guys experience hair loss before the 35. I guess your hair couldn't be pulled, uh, was, which could be a positive, but then also you don't have any hair. Right. So... This company, Keeps, which has been one of our longest uh, sponsors on the podcast, they help you keep your hair. That's a, that's why they have their name, Keeps. They have a clinically proven, FDA-approved hair treatment that you can go online to do. That means you don't have to go to a waiting room somewhere. You don't have to you know, go someplace. It can come straight to you. They have a physician online. They're there 24-7 if you have any questions. It's about half the cost uh, of other products. So I want you to check it out if you need them. Go to Keeps dot com slash door you're going to get 50 percent off your first order that's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash door 
50% off and hang on to your hair. <laughs> so I opened the bag. <laughs> so about the time she runs or comes around the corner, I'm eating the last one. Oh. And uh <laughs> The, so we're talking the big bag, not like a tube. Oh, we're talking about the of, big bag. I'd okay. say there's that at least. That can't be good for you. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Because <laughs> now I've laid down for another reason. <laughs> so, but what's so funny is because she's like, I mean, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> How could a person? I was like, you bought them. <laughs> You're the one that put this in front of me. Get behind me, yeah, Satan. Yeah, and I'm like, you make the beans and rice, you make the corn, I gorge myself, I fall asleep. <laughs> then I look up, and you now have a bag of white donuts just right there. And they were you so, know I love them. <laughs> and the problem was when I ate the first one, they were fresh. Ooh, they were soft, so fresh, it just softies. melted in my mouth. Yeah. Could you tie yeah. that into heaven? Because Jesus, one of the things he did when he was resurrected uh, he's in a resurrected body. It can go through walls, and he orders some fish. Yep. And he eats the fish. Well, he didn't order it. He is just it, went and. Is got that it. a hint that there will be uh, the partaking of food in oh, heaven? I hope he's so. in a glorified state. No, I believe it, Phil. I hope so. I've thought about that verse more than once. Why in the world? Would you? Okay, one, I see the miracle, and that because they didn't know who he was, and then. You know, they were a little unsure, but it was his third appearance. I mean, John 20 is one, and it actually goes in with Hebrews because when he talks about y'all believe because you see, but blessed are those who believe yep. and they don't see. Yep. So, I mean, it, it's a powerful yep. moment. But in that moment, I thought, why is he eating that fish? Because you think about once he was resurrected, he has an imperishable body. I and mean, he, still, he still has it. I mean, he left here. With it, right. so so he's not eating fish for sustenance. Why is he eating it? You're eating for for pleasure. I mean, I've heard pastors talk about that before. It's like yeah. think about how cool taste buds are. Yeah, like the fact that we can can eat meat and it's it's savory and also it it you know it's it sustains us and all those different things. Like that is a blessing of God. So why why would we not have that same just, blessing? Just, uh, you know, it, we're it, built to where the flavors themselves. You're getting the flavors out of it, the way your tongue is built. Then I guess, you know, what I guess department you, in salt water created that? That's that's, that's, that's why I'm, that was what was so satanic about the coronavirus is that first round of it. Ooh, it was we, taking away people's taste yeah. and smell. Yeah, yeah, that is true. I that mean, was that is weird. that is bad. I mean, that's without taste and smell, it's a pretty yeah. tough life. I mean, if you luckily for most people, it's temporary. Although you know, I know a couple of people here local. It's been a year and a half. It's still never been right again. They, yeah. Certain things like Lori at the church, she can't drink coffee now. It makes her sick physically. I mean, she mm. gets sick and ever since coronavirus. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. I know. Which I've always thought was because it was engineered. What do I know? Um, so I want to talk a little bit before we, because I want to get into Hebrews, because you were listening to our last podcast here, and um, you had some really good thoughts. I was like, all right, we're going we're gonna to get back into Hebrews. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, your podcast, and and so I, I did this last time. I think you were on, but I want to do it again because Jace wasn't here. But your mission statement on your website says, "Undaunted life equips men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience." Which I thought was really a great statement. So, yeah, it is. yeah, talk a little bit about kind of what you do. I mean, I know she had a lot of different guests on. Kind of what's your format? Because I want I want folks from unashamed audience to check out your podcast. Yeah, well, we'd love to have you guys over there. So I have a lot of different guests. So Phil's been on the show before, and so uh, you know, if I feel like they're going to be interesting to my you know eighty five ninety percent male audience, I'll have them on. And whether they're believers or not, now I will share the gospel with them if they're not, and I'll engage them in a way that is you know fruitful, uh, not only for the audience to hear but for that person to hear, but uh, equipping men to push back darkness. The thing is, is we all like to lament the darkness that we see in culture, but most men, at least my contention is, is that they have no idea how to push back against it. And part of it is because they're not being equipped to, right? So whether that's their pastor, that's not equipping them, whether they're not equipping themselves. So they want to be able to push back on the abortion issue, but a pro abortion person says, well, what if she's raped or what if it's incest? And all of a sudden their pro-life foundations just crumble to the floor. It's like, that's, that's not, 
unfortunate. That's unacceptable. And so men need to be equipped to be able to do that. But also a lot of men kind of live in, in their own little world, right? So their world is fantasy football or it's golf or it's, you know, even in Christian circles, like they, they will read the Bible and then nothing else. And so when they try to push back in the darkness of culture, they don't understand culture. And so like, you know, you should be mad about critical race theory in your kids, you know, elementary school, but you don't know where critical race theory comes from. You don't understand that it comes from critical legal studies and critical theory and the Frankfurt school and Karl Marx and, and all these different ideologies, because you can lament, you know, why do we live in this world where there's this untruth that that's being spoken all the time? Well, we live in a postmodernism type of culture where truth is considered to be relative. And so I try to, in a, in a digestible way, help guys, whether it's through interviews or whether it's through just me, you know, flowing for 45 minutes to an hour to understand these different topics so that when it comes up, not that they can dunk on somebody and like, I'm going to win this argument because Kyle taught me how it's like, no, no, no. if you're going to engage with things, truth is important. Yeah. But if you don't know what the truth is, and if you don't know how to bring people towards it uh, with logic or reasoning or, or your argumentation, it's it's kind of rough. And then just real quickly on spiritual, mental, physical resilience, everyone likes to talk about strength. You know, strength is really fun and like, oh, this guy did a strong thing, but strength wanes over time. We were just talking about that, you know, off air, like your body changes over time, like you're not as strong as you once were or whatever the situation is. But one thing you can be until your dying days, you can be resilient. Resilient is the ability to bounce back right? It's the ability to respond whenever, you know, you're being pushed upon, right? And so all these different ministries and everything likes to focus on strength, strength, strength. It's like, no, no, it's resilience because your strength will wane no matter what, spiritually, mentally, physically, you will run aground at some point and you've got to have the ability to bounce back because it's what's required of us. So you're a, <clears throat> you're a jujitsu guy like uh, Stone and uh, you're a purple belt uh, that mm -hmm. you just achieved that. And I wondered when you were just saying that, is that you think that's one of the things that drew you to that? Cause talking about the idea of resilience, cause that's really kind of the heart of that discipline, right? Yeah. So with jujitsu, for those of you not familiar, it's basically wrestling with submissions. That's kind of the easiest way. So you're not getting, you know, brain damage by taking a bunch of shots to the head or whatever. <laughs> Although that's also fun. Um, but like, but, but, but with jujitsu is the only people that stick around in that sport are people that are okay with constantly being humbled. Because if you walk in there super prideful, like, ah, oh, you know, I'm God's gift to athletics. I'm just going to go in here and throw a bunch of people around. No, you're not. No, you're not. It's not going to work. Like you, when, when somebody walks in on their first day and they go with somebody that's, you know, purple, brown, black belt, it's like handing them a baby. Yeah. It's like, they know nothing. Like they, they, they can't defend themselves. And so some people can't take that. And so they'll train for a couple of weeks and then they'll, they'll go back and do something else. Cause they can't stand to constantly get pounded on and to constantly make mistakes. And because, you know, we're simulating real violence, right? Because if this were on the street, you don't tap, right? Like, you know, they broke yeah. your arm or they passed you out cold. Right. But, but that's the thing is that sport is the only way you come back into the gym the next day is if you're focused on your resilience, because you're going to be beaten up, you're going to be injured. There's a, there's a lot of things that could happen to you. Uh, but it's the ability to bounce back and kind of constantly grind. Like that's where, that's where that, that, that toughness comes from. And it's, it's more than physical, certainly. So I watched it <coughs> last Stone night. Stone say, uh, I broke, broke, broke. Well, broke Stone, Stone's yeah. finding out at 46, there's a lot of difference than being 34. <laughs> broke yeah. a rib uh, yesterday in training. <laughs> yeah, but, but Phil, Stone first got into boxing. Right. And mm -hmm. the reason he got into what, what uh, y'all are talking about now, what's it called? Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu-Jitsu. Is because, you know, he was a sparring, uh, he had a sparring match, and he was all nervous about it. He was talking to me before he went up there. So when I saw him, I mean, he, he was, after the match, he was barely moving around. And I said, well, how'd it go? And he said, I got destroyed. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, they kept tabs of the punches, and it was like 300, because I kept pressing him for, how many he landed? He said it was like 321 to 23. <laughs> I said, 321 to 23? That wasn't a sparring session. It was a beat You down. were a punching That's why bag. he was moving so slowly. Yeah, so he that's what sent him packing on the yeah. bike. Because to your point, if you keep doing this, there's going to be no bouncing back. Well, yeah. Your, your eyes are going to close, and you're going to go bye bye. Even with pads on and and uh, you know the uh, yeah. pads on your face. Yeah. Well, and the, the thing with boxing is it's almost impossible to go full bore in practice because yeah. of the the potential for brain damage or you know permanent yeah. injury. But in jujitsu, you can go as hard as you possibly want yeah, to. That's what he said. Right. And yeah. so it's like, and then you just tap. And as long as you're not training with a jerk, yeah. like they'll let you go. And so like, that's this, this kind of thing. But if you're training, you know, Muay Thai kickboxing, boxing, you know, those types of things, like those disciplines basically require you to take a lot of those shots in order for you to understand 
how to move your head off the center line and all these all these different things. So but I, I saw it last night, which was interesting. Uh, let's take another break. So one of the things I've loved about having Kyle on the podcast is it kind of reminds us of when we were younger. You know, our muscles were, you know, a little bit more taunt. <laughs> Uh, back in the day, uh, when you're younger, you know, you're you're at your peak of your testosterone production. And that helps when it comes to workouts, when it comes to, you know, how you are, how you look. Uh, so if you want more energy to counter the negative physical effects of aging, Nugenics Total T Testosterone Booster with Testophen will help you turn back the clock, re-energize your workouts, and get you better results at the gym and help you look and feel like the man you want to be like Kyle. It's been validated in five different clinical studies. It boosts free testosterone that the aging process robs you of. And so that's something I definitely need and looking forward to trying this product. Uh, It's the number one selling testosterone booster at uh, GNC and it can re-energize your life. Powerful, confident, good looking warrior that you used to be. Now you can get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea when you text UNASHAMED to 231-231. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo, their most powerful fat incinerator ever, with key ingredients to help you get back into shape fast. Absolutely free. Text UNASHAMED to 231-231. That's UNASHAMED 231-231. Message and data rates may apply. Terms apply. Available at Nugenics.com slash terms. Which was interesting because Sage, my my Stone's youngest daughter, she's seven years old, a little frisky, you call her now. So, and she apparently she's got a pretty good little just natural ability in jujitsu. I mean, she she rolls and no boy can keep up. Everybody her age, they, boy girl doesn't matter. She she's dominating. <clears throat> of course, you know Stone loves it because it's your kid, and you know he he. Well, and she's thick, and she's boy, she's got a she's <laughs> she, got quite the spunky. fire. She's spunky. Yeah, she she, she comes in, and what's the thing she was wearing? What's that called? Her uh, she was wearing a rash guard. All right, rash yep. guard. So she comes in, and so she had just been to practice, and she comes in, so. You know, she hadn't met Kyle yet. You know, he, he's a purple belt, which is, you know, pretty high up their, their rankings there. And uh, But he starts telling her, oh, come put me in a hold. So she comes behind him and you know, do this. And he's giving her some instruction. I'm watching this. And, of course, she's seven years old. Yeah. And, and he's 34, you know, and, and well-built man. But she when, she when she got the thing, all of a sudden his face – just turned as red as this cup and i'm watching which it. isn't that ex- you know because i'm a ginger and so that just happens normally like whenever i'm just operating but the thing that was cool about that is like she's you know she's got her little arms she's got them wrapped around my neck but i'm still coaching her yeah as yeah. she's slowly separating me from my consciousness <laughs> and so it's like i'm having to like walk her through yeah yeah just put put your hand right there and yeah, yeah just squeeze squeeze but like that's the thing it was it was a cool moment it was for great and i and i had because i hadn't been to the gym and so then he taps her arm in which they train them early when the tap comes you back oh, off because wow. you're training but she when she first started carly's boyfriend joey he's 17 years old well, he's just down there watching them. You know, he's thinking about doing it. Well, Sage comes up behind him and puts him in the same hole, but he doesn't know about tapping. So he just, whoop, he's out. I mean, she just, he passed smooth out. 17-year-old yeah. buck. But that can prove out, as it turns out, it can turn out to be a very helpful thing. Well, especially if she's deal. dating yeah. a guy when she's 16, and she's like, no. Yeah. And the next thing you know, he's looking up at the stars. Boy. <laughs> what just happened? I I mean, I do, I do well, like it. And they do self defense classes. Uh, there's a lot of law, local law enforcement that are part of this. Uh, and Jay's, Jay and Martinez have this gym that, in school. Right. Yeah. And so it's a really good deal. So I, I did, I'd forgotten that you were a jiu-jitsu guy until we got to talking about it last night. So, But I understand the idea of it, especially with sort of your spiritual mission mm. and what you're doing as well, which is really good. So anyway, we're glad you're here. So I want to I want to get back to Hebrews. Um, because you had a good quote before we came on, because Zach had the Chesterton quote where he was talking about the idea of, of unreality uh, that he made. But you had a Muggridge, which that's a not quite a contemporary. He's a little bit later than Chesterton. But you had an interesting quote. So set that up and that'll get us back into the text. Yeah. So when I was listening to you all talk about Hebrews 11 and you know talking about being able to accept truth, I remembered last summer when you all were going through Romans. And so uh, Romans 1 verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. So I remember writing this uh, in my in my note Bible uh, last year, but it's a Malcolm Muggeridge quote, and it's uh, until at last having educated himself into imbecility, 
and polluted and drugged himself into stupefaction, he killed over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and became extinct. But the, the big thing, and I wrote it in like literally a different, uh, different color, educated himself into imbecility. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so that's kind of where we are in this culture to where it's like, we don't want to rest on the scripture, where the scripture, because like, you know, scripture can't tell you, you know, where you should eat for lunch today or who the 12th president of the United States was. But there are a lot of things scripture can inform for us in terms of our worldview. But even Christians, we want to look outside of it first and backfill it with scripture. Right. And maybe maybe we've learned that from pastors that are basically doing TED Talks with a few Bible verses sprinkled on top. And the, the problem with that approach is when you're not exegeting the scripture, when you're not really digging into the word and like, what is the word telling us? Now you're eisegeting. You're basically trying to make it say what you want it to say. Yeah. Because again, we've educated ourselves in imbecility. We think we're so smart and yet we can't tell you what a woman is. We can't, you know, tell you why you should, you know, do this in life as opposed to that. And it's because we're, we're going outside of the moral dictates of God because we think we're so smart. And then that interesting that you, you brought that up. I'm so glad you did <clears throat> that. That that question now is being asked almost in every congressional hearing or whatever. So these people in the most in the Biden administration, they say, "Can you can you define what a woman is?" I, it's amazing. Yeah, they how, can though. They can. They, well, J, what's what you were talking about? But I think uh, Jason the the OT the or, lie. Where, where it's like they know, but they, they don't know. want to admit that they know. Yeah, and I think that's why when you start believing a lie long enough, it becomes some sort of truth to you. Yeah. You know, and you'll defend it. That's that's why I said the education system, because you, I'm seeing, you know, the what's coming out of these college systems. Uh, my acquired daughter from Nicaragua. I mean, I just, I would just see some of the stuff that was that was going through there, and I was like, really? But you know, I, I mean, I, I think it's a valid point. What's crazy to me is our last podcast. I brought up the same thing about people preaching in a way that's like. God is going to do me a favor and help me be the best I can be. He's going to improve me and yeah. with that ice. What, what you call it? Ice of Jesus. Yeah, instead ice of exegesis. Yeah, <clears throat> it's like you insert yourself into the situation and somehow find out what's best for you. Well, because you know, you know, the Bible's about us, right? Like yeah, that, that's the whole point of the Bible. The Bible's about me. Like yeah. I am David in the story of David and Goliath, right? Yeah. Like obviously, yeah. I'm the point. And yeah. so, but the thing and is, my pronouns are. Yeah, we we live in this modern like therapeutic I agree. culture. I didn't realize that just up until the last couple of weeks ago. I mean, I just really didn't see that connection being made in the churches until all of a sudden I'm just everywhere I look. It seems to be that's what's happening. And uh, which is which why is we've disturbing. been so, and I say we in a big quotes, but have been so ineffective mm -hmm. in really impacting our culture for something better than it is. Well, it's like I've, when when preachers and pastors, people that are building churches, they're doing everything they can to make their church seem like the culture, right? Mm -hmm. So the first song of the worship set is a. A secular song where they add a few Bible verses on the screen while they sing it and they try to make everything man friendly and super approachable and, and you know there's some some arguments we could get into that are positive for that but the whole point is that you need to require everything of people in order for them to become a Christian. But we try to make the barrier to entry so small, like, hey, just, you know, just hop over this little bitty, little bitty hill, and then then we'll, we'll let you in and it'll be fine. And it's like the, the, the churches that are dying on the vine are the ones that are making it too simple and too easy for people to just come in and not change their life at all. But that's like, Christ doesn't give us that option. Like yeah. you, your entire life has to be redirected and pointed in the direction of Christ. And so the church should require a lot of people. We were talking about Jordan Peterson off air before this. Like that's what he, his message to these Christian churches is like, don't require a little of these young men require everything because that's something a little, a little young man can get behind. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you know, mm -hmm. when, when you're, and we have a general that's trying to lead you into battle or something like that. You're not saying, hey, you know, come with me over to Normandy. And we'll just see what happens. Yeah. Right. We'll we'll just kind of like, you know, once we get to the beach, we'll kind of figure it out. And if it gets a little sketchy, we'll just we'll leave. You know, yeah. it's no big deal. Right. Like, no, these these boys hopped off their farms in middle America and they were sent over to Europe because there was something that they were called to that was way bigger than them. Yeah. And when they got off and were shot to pieces, they kept going. Right. Until they conquered the hill. During that particular time frame. Uh, these United States was a lot more spiritual nation, faith in God, Absolutely. than they are now. Right. Because when I looked up out there on that, walked out there on that Omaha beach and looked over to the bluffs, I'd say about a quarter, less than a quarter, they had to go from right here to the base of that and scale that. I thought, 
you would have had to have been, the fear of God was with you and the love of God had to be with you when you said, all right, here we go. Well, you get up on the top of that thing where they told France, just give us room here for our dead. And the crosses just go out of sight up on top of that hill. You know, it's big pot mark, big holes where them bombs hit. But anyway, all of them, and it's, you know, Alabama, you know, New York, you know, was every state. Yep. You know, some of them it said, no, no, we can't, couldn't find out. Yeah. I didn't have enough to yeah, identify where, where, where he came from right. or whatever. You know, only God knows. But uh, it was an eye opening side, by the way. Hang on, Dad, before you read that, let's take another break. We, we, we tend to forget in any culture, we tend to forget the, uh, the ravages of sin. And that Romans 1, it goes on to say, in other words, in other words, they exchange the glory of God, verse 23, for the immortal God, for images made to look like mortal man, birds, animals, reptiles, they bow down to them. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts for sexual impurity. And it mentions, you know, same sex, males having sex with males, female with females, <clears throat> women abandon natural relations for unnatural ones. Just look at this. Men abandon natural relations with women, were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men, and they received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Well, in the real world, though, when there's a lot of immorality, especially in the sexual nature, it's not just that. It usually goes along with drunkenness and drugs and these wild parties. And, and for people to say that that's not going on, they're just not telling the truth. Right. I mean, that's what that's the, the bulk. One little of bitty that peel lifestyle. and you take it and. Over 100,000 last year from 18 to 25, you're like, do what? One peel, fentanyl. Right. I mean, well, we're not over 100,000. Right. The, it's the leading cause of death for, for Americans age 18 to 45 or something like that. These young you work with, I mean, there's Romans 1 all the way down to chapter 3. Finally, the doctrine of condemnation is what a lot of them call it. That, that bunch of scripture. But now, finally, a righteousness from God is apart from law has been made known in which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ when, to all who believe. There's no difference because everybody's sinned and fallen. So when you get the book of Hebrews, that faith keeps showing up. Faith, 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 believe. Yeah. There's power in faith, and it's a very protective power. When your sins are removed, God's Spirit indwells your body, and love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all these right. wonderful qualities you say. Without <clears throat> faith, they ain't, they ain't there. Well, there's, there's power just, in faith, but there's also power in a moral law that God gave us with which to differentiate between good and evil. And the thing that we can't do in modern culture is we can't te tell people, hey, stop doing that particular sex act that is opening you up to this potential disease. That's right. Because that would be moralizing. We're not allowed to do that. And people have convinced and Christians have been convinced by culture that don't push your morals on me. And, we're be, and you know, dumb Christians will be like, yeah, that sounds reasonable. You're like, but it's, you're trying, but, we're trying to help you. Right. But then like you. the culture is pushing their morals on you, but that's okay? Because yeah. wh what are their morals based in, right? Because they think that we're highly evolved goo, that became highly evolved fish, that became highly evolved chimps, and now we're us, right? And we wear pants and talk to each other in these weird languages. It's like, yeah. your worldview doesn't give us an ought. It gives us an is. My worldview gives us both. And like that, that's the difference with a lot of these people is they, again, they just, they want to moralize to you while telling you don't moralize to me. That's it. Yeah. Well, it's like last time I talked about this faith. I mean, it's not just like uh, believing in hocus pocus or I hope. It, it's not just some genie in a bottle like, well, I hope this is true. Because I think that's the, kind of the world's view of that. You're, you're just, you know, what you call faith is just making a wish and blowing out a candle or whatever. It's based on the promises, God, which we talked about last podcast. But here... I'm glad you read that uh, Romans 3, yeah, look, 21. Look, I look, wrote a well, book. Let me, let me finish my statement, <laughs> Phil. Uh, Just trying to pitch a book Romans here. 3, 21 says, 
It's the righteousness from God. So if you think about where faith comes from, if you consider the promises of God and the righteousness of God, we're not out there trying to promote our lifestyle. We're promoting the righteousness of God. It's his righteousness, not ours, because we're just like everybody else. You give us a second, we're going to screw it up. Yeah. So, I mean, I I think that's important. Yeah. It's a good point. So what you read it, I was just highlighting it. Let's take another break. Well, I wanted to jump into this. I want to read the middle, but I want to jump into verse 6 to tie it into the first three verses of Hebrews 11. And then we'll talk about uh, those. There's two individuals that are mentioned. But I want to jump ahead to his final thought because he says, and let me read the first three. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And now he's going to start going through those ancients. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible, which we spent the whole podcast last time talking about that. I mean, that's quite a statement. It, it, it's really hard to get your head wrapped around that. It is. I, I get it. Yeah, it's tough. But but I think six gives us some clues. So then you get to verse six and it says he kind of, he kind of, finishes that thought by saying, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And to your point about the low bar, I think, Kyle, I mean, first to believe in who he is, but then to seek him, you know, I mean, that's, that's where it gets into what does that take? It takes more than me just saying, oh, yeah, that sounds better than what I'm doing now. Yeah. And then just, you know, it was just a, what does uh, Zach call it? It's like a bellhop. If I need you again. Yeah, cosmic bellhop. Yeah, I'll ask like, for something. Life yeah. and death is hanging on it. Well, life and death but, is hanging on faith but see, or not. The, to me, the first thing, the first impression I get when I read this is like, we, we were talking about, this is the opposite of the education system, which is just compiling as much information as you possibly can get in your brain, whether it's right or wrong. But the Hebrew writer says, this is a person. Yep. That To me, that's what just like the just uh, fireworks go off. Because he's like, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Well, that should get your attention. You're like, oh, what is, what, what is this faith? Because then he says, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And we've never uh, seen him. We've, you, you. I mean, to me, but I just think most people think, oh, I, I got to learn about God. I got to learn about God. And that's why the difference is knowing God and knowing about God, or you know, having information and knowing the informant, the right. person. You can, I mean, you just think if I, if I was going to marry my wife and I just studied her, studied her and I knew all the facts about her, but I didn't know her. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be a creep. So you're a stalker. (laughs) Right. Well, (laughs) even you're talking about the education system, like education system is based on a materialist understanding, right? So here are the things that we can know, like this is a cup, this is a phone, this is a pen. It's a materialist understanding. But if you were to teach a kid in high school, uh, you know, hey, can we, you know, we're going to go to science lab and you're going to prove that you love your mom and dad using science. (laughs) <laughs> well, Cricket. so so there's Crickets. something immaterial to that <laughs> yeah. knowledge, right? Right. And so, but also it, it's the immaterial knowledge, which is where we get faith. Faith has kind of gotten a bad rap. We all have faith. And you mentioned your chair last time. You have faith that this chair is going to stand up, but you're not thinking about it. We right. have faith that if we go outside and all of us jump up in the air, not one of us isn't going to, you know, take off into outer space. But right. then you get into verse seven. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Reverent fear. We do not fear God anymore, right? Yeah. We do not have reverence because that's where that's where you get reverence is from fear. So there's a pastor out of Tennessee uh, named Matty Montgomery. He used to be a, a singer of a metal band, but he wrote a book called Scary God. And it was, you know tens of thousands of pages on the scariness of God and why we should orient ourselves around that 
and it would make us reverent and we would lead a reverent life. But again, we're typically scared of things we can see. We're scared of a gun in our face. We're scared of the ocean where we can see the great white shark, but we're not scared of the things that we can't see, like eternal damnation. And it's like, <laughs> it's only where you get this Hell reverence, fire. Right, fire. right? Like it's probably going to be hot, but like, that's the thing is like the, the reverence, we're losing out on that reverence because culturally we're not reverent of anything. We're not reverent of old people. We're not reverent of our parents. We're not reverent of 2000 years of gospel truth because it seems old timey. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, again, we're smarter than that. Right. Like we don't need this old book. They walked around in sandals and dirt. Right. Mm -hmm. They didn't have iPhones. Like, how could they possibly know more than we do? It's just this it's this intellectual snobbery. Yeah, I think it's a valid point. Noah, Uh, when warned about things not yet seen, because God said, Noah, you're going to need a boat. I want you to build it. I'll give you the dimensions on it and all that. But it's going to take you a while. Be a big one. And he's like, so why, why, why would I need a boat here? He said, big water coming. Big water. <laughs> I don't think it had rained either. It hadn't. At this I mean, point. No, I, things I, not we, yet we seen. Read about it, right? Well, you know, you're told that and you said, you want me to do what? And he tells you, and this guy gets out there and labors for how long did it? A hundred years. A hundred years. They, he starts building, people coming up. What, what are you doing? <laughs> He says, big water coming. He, he, he <laughs> warned him. He warned him. He said, by faith, he condemned the world. He says, going to drown you all. You need a boat. And, and they were like, you talk about an idiot. So you just think about when we talk about faith, just think about old Noah saying, I'll do what you say. Okay, you tell me what, how to put it together, and I'll put it together. And to this day, they can say what they want to, atheist or not, but there's a lot of evidence that there was a big water on the earth at one time. Well, by the way, well, I don't think by the way, just, if you want to see it, you can go to Kentucky because an old boy has built it by the exact right. dimensions. That guy invented me to come, <laughs> uh, invented, invited me to come over there and take a look at it's it. It's quiet to the well, look. That's why what? the scientists said, well, I'm not sure the boat was big enough to house all the animals at that time, you know. Yeah, go so. check it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what I was going to say, it's not just about people who don't believe, though. It's like, because you made a good point. I mean, look, I always err on the side of grace when I'm dealing in the world. I mean, it, when I do events that's worldly based, I, I, I err on, on uh, you know, the, the grace, because the grace of God teaches us to say no. But in the church, it's a little different. Mm. If you have a guy, you know, like uh, the passage in Timothy that's, that's, uh, trying to gain control over weak will women, whatever yep. that, that verse is, who yep. are taking advantage or manipulating that. When we have that conversation, it's way more judgment. Because mm-hmm. I know that I've read, you know, in the New Testament, when you're using the church and when you're using Christ to take advantage of people or abuse kids or manipulate people or, Woo. you know, I, I really believe there's a special place in hell reserved for people like that and i point that out Mm because it's like it's one thing to know this it's another thing to know about jesus and use that and use a church setting for your own personal appetites and the bible is really strong on the consequences of that yeah and uh, so in that case i'm erring on the side because they've already they they've already heard the grace of jesus Mm -hmm. but their heart is hard for whatever reason but you know, I think I think it 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 should be taught more. Well, and it's not just like the that's the whole point of Second Corinthians. And you know, we went through First and Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians was Paul saying, "There are wolves here, and I'm going to wade in here, and we're going to deal with this situation." Yeah. And he went back and forth because he was like, "Look, I love you. I don't want to be harsh." You know, I, you know, but but these yeah, there's people, a place for there's what, a place well, for yours that. said reverent fear. Mine said holy fear. Yeah, which. You know, I never really thought about that phrase, to be honest. But yeah. a holy fear is 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 healthy at times. Well, think about you it know? like when you walk into a situation with, with your spouse, right? And it's a maybe a volatile subject you're about to get into, or maybe there's a Band-Aid that's about to get ripped off. If you approach that with holy fear or reverent mm-hmm. fear, that doesn't mean you're, you're cowering and you're scared. Mm-hmm. It means mm-hmm. there is a gravity to this moment that I could super mess up if I'm stupid. Yeah. And so you're approaching uh-huh. it in a different way because you're reverent. And think about, have you ever been in a room or met somebody before where there's a reverence for that person, a deep level of automatic respect for that mm-hmm. person? Like, that's how I try to be with my wife. And I do that super imperfectly every single day. But if I have a reverent fear for her honor, 
How would I treat her as opposed to whenever I'm being a prideful jerk, right? Yeah. It's going to be very, very different if you, you know, basically set yourself up in that way. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a great attitude to have towards God. I mean, there's, look, we have fun. There's, there's, I mean, there's celebration time and there's worship time, but there's also, I do think sometimes where you look around at society and the world and what's going on in our families and, you know, we need a good dose of holy fear, you know? Yeah. I mean, God cannot be mocked. So uh, we're out of time. Um, it's always a blessing to have you on, Kyle. And we do have an overtime segment that uh, we want you to stay around for, which uh, our audience can get to by going to blazetv.com slash unashamed. And in that, I want to talk about that because recently we talked on a recent podcast about fear because we were going back from Chapter 10. Mm. And so I want to get your take on that about fear not versus fear of the Lord, kind of the difference in the two. So we'll do that in the overtime so, Kyle, it's always a pleasure having you on the podcast. Unashamed and Undaunted come That's together, right. which is really good. Tell uh, tell our listeners where they can find your podcast and website and all that. Yeah, podcast is everywhere you get your podcast. So, Undaunted Life, a man's podcast, and you can search my name, Kyle Thompson, as well. Uh, our website is just www.undaunted.life. And so, if you want to follow us on Instagram or any of those other social medias, you can find us there by searching that. All right. We encourage you guys to uh, check him out, and uh, you're, you'll be blessed if you do. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.